Okay, in this video, we're going to review all of the methods that we've covered for solving a quadratic equation. <clears throat> Moving forward into second semester, we want to make sure that we are just very comfortable with all of these methods that we've spent time covering because we're going to apply them. We're going to see them within trigonometric relationships and other things. So we want to be able to use the methods effectively. So let's just put them all in one place, kind of sum it up. <clears throat> the first method that we talked about um, that can be applied anytime you're solving uh, a function is graphing. Um, if you can draw the graph or a calculator can draw the graph of the function, remember that when you graph, the solutions are the x-intercepts. And specifically, again, they're the x-intercepts. So you're not looking for y-intercepts or other things like that. And there's a couple situations that can happen with quadratics, right? Um, one, if this is my x-y axis, uh, I could have a parabola that crosses twice. Whether it's upside down or concave um, up, this guy crosses twice, so there would be two solutions there, and we say that there are two real solutions, and you could figure them out. You'd know x equals the one value and x equals the other value. Um, another thing that can happen is if we have our coordinate axes here, sometimes the parabola just touches the x-axis and there's only one x-intercept. This guy would have one real solution, or we call it a repeated real solution. Um, he just bounces off the x-axis, and that would be our solution. And then the last thing that can happen, right, is that we could have a quadratic um, that is entirely above or below the x-axis. In this case, there are zero real solutions. So if we are looking to solve this one by graphing, um, we can't. We need to solve this one algebraically um, because we will be able to find two imaginary solutions or complex. So <clears throat> those are kind of the situations that can happen with our parabolas. Uh, let's just do one quick example. So off to the right here, I have x squared. Uh, let's do uh, minus 14x plus 33 is equal to negative 7. Now if I want to plug this into the calculator, I need to make sure that it's equal to 0 so I can put it into the y equals. So I would maybe add the 7 over to the left side. I get x squared minus 14x plus 40 is equal to 0. And then I would go ahead and I would graph this. So <clears throat> you can draw it by hand or again if you want to just graph it on your calculator. That's probably the easiest and quickest way to do that. So again, you can use the calculator app or Desmos. I'm going to pull up the calculator app. We go to our y equals and we plug that function in. So we have x squared there minus 14x plus 40. And we can go ahead and graph that. When you graph that function, right, you can see, and mine's a little bit weird. It's like stretched out horizontally. But you can see where it's crossing. And if you count it on there, the tick marks, it would be 1, 2, 3, 4. And it looks like it's crossing right there at 4. Um, I don't know if you can see that. Uh, <clears throat> so one of the solutions would be 4. The other one it looks like would be 10. Okay, so you can see where it's crossing. Or again, you could look at your table. Your table will also tell you, notice there's 10, 0 is one solution. The other one is at 4, 0. So we can see those from the table. So <clears throat> if they come out as nice integer values, um, then these are pretty easy to find. So again, if this was crossing at 4 and then clear out here at 10, our parabola looks something like this. So our two solutions there would be 4 and 10. Those are the two values that work. The second method that we talked about um, would, was factoring. Um, <clears throat> and when we are factoring, uh, we just said, OK, well, sometimes we have an equation that can't be solved like a linear function because there's an x squared term and an x term. So let's say we have something like 3x squared minus 20x minus 89 is equal to x plus 1. And we said, well, let's make this equal 0. And if we set it equal to 0, um, then we can factor it into things that multiply to 0, which means one of these pieces has to be equal to 0, right? So we can find our two solutions there. So in order to do this, again, we move everything to one side. So maybe we subtract this x. I'm going to line it up with its like term. We subtract the 1. And it looks like we would end up with 3x squared minus 21x minus 90 is equal to 0. We then look for a greatest common factor. It looks like a 3 is going to divide out of all terms. And again, we can only divide out a value if we do it to every single term. And we end up with x squared minus 7x minus 30 is equal to 0. And then we look to see 
if we can backwards FOIL. So first times first, we split up the x squared would be x and x. Then we look at our last value, that 30. We need values that multiply to negative 30. So we know that one will be positive, one will be negative, or we can't get a negative 30. And in that case, <clears throat> we also look for factors that will add to the middle term or subtract in this case. So um, if we use 10 and 3, notice that 10, uh, negative 10 and a positive 3 would give me that negative 7 there in the middle. So then to state the solutions, this would be x is equal to positive 3, because a 3 might, uh, oh, I apologize, negative 3, because negative 3 plus 3 would make this piece 0. And this solution here would be a positive 10 because 10 minus 10 would give us the zero we're looking for. So those would be our solutions based off factoring. Again, we talked about factoring is probably the fastest way to solve if it can break apart nicely. Um, if we run into something uh, that doesn't have a B term or a middle term, um, then we just had to use square roots. So we talked about this one was kind of our square root method. Um, if you have something like 6x squared minus 5 is equal to 19, there is no um, squared term and middle term like there is when we're trying to factor. So we can just get the x squared by itself and use square roots to solve. So we would add 5 to both sides. 6x squared is equal to 24. We would divide by 6 as we try to isolate the x term. Right, And then we want to undo the squared, so in order to do that, we square root. And remember, when you square root, we have to consider both of those possibilities, the positive and the negative. So in this case, x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 4, which is just 2. So that would be solving with square roots. And again, we can use that anytime there is an x squared term, but the b value is 0, or in other words, there's no x term. Another time we use square roots is if it's already in vertex form. So if we have something like this example off to the right, um, this one is in vertex form already. Oops, it's equal to, let's say, negative 24. If I'm solving this one, this one actually looks very similar to the one that we just did here. Um, <clears throat> but again, we have a plus one inside there, but the steps are really the same. So what we would do here, right, again, is we're going to isolate the squared term, which has the x in it. So we get 2, oh sorry, negative 2 times x plus 1 squared, and we add the 12 over, which gives us negative 12. We then divide by the negative 2, and we get x plus 1 squared equals 6. Then again, to undo the squared, we square root. And when you do that, it introduces that plus or minus, so don't forget that. We get x plus 1 is equal to plus or minus the square root of 6. Now, the square root of 6 doesn't simplify down any further, so I'm going to leave it as that. <clears throat> and then we will subtract the 1 over so that the x is by itself. So x is equal to negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 6. And that represents our two solutions there. Okay. Uh, two more methods. So if there was a middle term <clears throat> and we wanted to put it in vertex form so that we could solve with square roots, then we do what we call completing the square. Right? This is the one we force it to be factorable and put it into uh, vertex form to solve. So if we looked at an, um, an example like 4x squared plus 16x minus 45 is equal to negative 5, um, again, I could set it equal to 0 just to see if it's going to be factorable. I would add 5. I would end up with 4x squared plus 16x minus 40 is equal to 0. I look for a greatest common factor, and it looks like everything is divisible by 4. So we divide 4 out of every term. We end up with x squared plus 4x minus 10 is equal to 0. Now, if I look to see if that's factorable, there isn't anything that multiplies to negative 10 that has a difference of 4. So this case, I know it's not factorable. I'm going to move the negative 10 off to the side. Or you can move it to the other side of the equation. We just practiced this method more, so I'm going to leave it there. And this is where we're going to add in that perfect value and then also balance out the equation. So to find the perfect value, we take half the middle term, 
and we square it. So two squared is four. So if I add four, we want to keep this balanced. We're going to subtract four here on the right. That allows us, right, to create this nice little factorable piece that would be x plus two, x plus two minus 14 equal to zero. So we write that as x plus two squared. And I'm gonna add the 14 over. This is now in like our vertex form that we can then just square root to get rid of that. Square root both sides and we're almost solved. So we have x plus two is equal to plus or minus the square root of 14, which again, 14 will only break down to two and seven, so it doesn't simplify any further. Then we subtract the two over. So in this case, x is equal to negative two plus or minus the square root of 14. Um, <clears throat> all right, the last method, and I'm just going to squish it on here, uh, was we talked about how to create the quadratic formula was by completing the square. Instead of having to do that every single time, the quadratic formula has essentially completed the square for you. So that was the last method that we talked about. So the quadratic formula, again, was already solved for x, and we just had to take opposite of the b value plus or minus, we took b squared and we subtracted four times a times the c value, and that was divided by two times the a value. So if we use um, an example for this one, let's look at <clears throat> um, 2x squared plus 3x minus seven is equal to two. Now if I want to simplify or solve this with a quadratic formula, I need it first to be equal to zero so I can identify my correct a, b, and c values. So let's subtract the two over to the left and we get 2x squared plus 3x minus 9 is equal to 0. Um, once we have that, then we can identify that as our a, b, and c value. So it looks like a would be 2, b would be 3, and c would be that negative 9. Um, from there, <clears throat> I'm going to plug this in. So I'm going to go off to the right to see if I have more room. We're going to go opposite of b, or in other words, negative 3, because b is a positive 3, plus or minus the square root of. We do b squared minus 4 times the a value, which is 2, times the c value, which is negative 9, all over 2 times, again, that a value, which was 2. And then we simplify. And just remember with the quadratic formula, we always simplify inside the radical first. Um, so we would take 3 squared. We would subtract 4, multiply that by 2, and negative 9, right? Um, just simplify that whole inside, and we end up with 81 in this case. So we know the square root of 81, right, is 9. So this is really just negative 3 plus or minus 9 over 4. And remember, if the radical <coughs> um, simplifies completely, then we find the two values. And there's two options here, right? We use the positive sign first, so negative 3 plus 9 over 4 which in this case, negative 3 plus 9 is 6 over 4, or in other words, 2 thirds. So 2 thirds, oh, I wrote that wrong, 3 halves would be one solution. So if we were to graph this, that x-intercept would be at 1.5. Or, right, we use the negative. So we do negative 3 minus 9 over 4, which is negative 12 over 4 which when we divide that, we end up with negative three. So there's our two solutions. So all of these methods are fair game if they're applicable and usable um, <clears throat> in each of their situations. And we're going to use all of these methods as we start to solve systems of nonlinear equations. We're gonna see some of these quadratics within our geometric relationships as well. So we wanna make sure that we're comfortable with each of them.